Our next lecture is going to cover the evolution of animals. And today we're specifically going to focus on invertebrates. And then our next lecture will cover the vertebrates. So before we move on to kind of talking about the original animals on the planet, I want to talk just a little bit about kind of humans. And so humans are thought to be, well, at least we think of ourselves as being the most successful animals. And most of this success is going to be due to our brain. So we are going to be able to do things that other organisms can't do because of the large capacity of our brains. If you look at the ratio of our brain volume to body mass, it's going to be about 2.5 times bigger than you would see in our closest primate relative. And so if you look at the skulls in this image, you can see that the area that would contain the actual brain of the chimpanzee is quite small compared to our brain case. Now, with this large brain, we then are able to deal with lots of different issues. We can do, have problem solving. We have the ability to have language, logic, and these things aren't necessarily unique to humans, um, but we are going to be able to possess them in kind of a, a very extreme form. Now, if we look at the body size of humans, we've remained roughly the same size for about 1.5 million years, but the brain has increased by 40%, which is pretty dramatic um, over that period of time. So if you look at very early humans, they would have had smaller brains than we do today. Now, there are other animals that can do some things that we definitely can't. They can fly, breathe underwater, it can produce millions of offspring in their own lifetime, and none of them are going to be able to match our ability to learn or change our behavior. Um, it's not saying that other organisms can't learn and change their behavior, but humans seem to be unrivaled in our ability to be adaptable. Now, if we look at kind of all of animals, humans are just going to be one of the 1.3 million species of animals that are have been currently named by by biologists that's probably not an accurate number there's probably a lot more but at the time at this time this is what the number is and we're going to look at the amazing diversity that has arisen over the hundreds of millions of years that we think the animals have been on the planet and these animals are going to be shaped by natural selection and adapting to kind of the different environments on the planet. So now we're going to talk about the origins of animal diversity. And we're going to have to go back to the Precambrian time where animal life is thought to have begun in the seas. Okay, And this was the evolution of a multicellular creature that started to eat other organisms. So animals are going to be eukaryotic. They are multicellular and they're going to be heterotrophic, which means that they are going to obtain their nutrients from eating other organisms. Okay? And they're able to digest the food within their bodies. So unlike something like a fungus, fungus are going to digest their food outside of their body and then kind of take it into their body. But animals are going to do the digestion inside. Animals are not going to have cell walls. So unlike funguses and plants, they're not going to have a cell wall, okay, which is then going to require other types of ways of supporting the body. Most animals will have muscle cells and also nerve cells. So the muscle cells will help for different types of movement and nerve cells are going to be able to control those muscles. Now, not all animals are going to have muscle cells or nerve cells, but the majority of them will. So what is an animal? So most animals are going to be diploid, which means that they're going to have two copies of the chromosomes in their uh, cells. They're going to reproduce sexually. Um, there are going to be some groups that can reproduce asexually, but the dominant number of organisms in the animals are going to reproduce sexually. They're going to proceed through all the basic stages found in the kind of 
most animal cycles. And so we'll go through a zygote stage uh, that then goes through mitosis and we go through these different steps um, to form something called the eight cell stage a blastula and um, ultimately become kind of the adult organism over time. If we look at this sea star life cycle, you can see that we start kind of with a larva that then is going to go under a major body change called metamorphosis. And while you might think that humans don't do this during embryonic development, there are going to be these different steps and changes of body form. Um, we don't see it because it's happening in the womb, but there are going to be these different kind of stages. Now we want to look back to what would have been kind of the ancestral form that led to the animals. And it's thought that animals evolved from a colonial flagellated protist so that we see on this image. Okay. It's thought to have happened during the Cambrian explosion, although molecular data has pointed that we think animals were actually um, kind of originated much earlier than that. But the oldest animal fossils that have been found so far are about 560 million years old. And you can see a couple examples of these in these um, fossil imprints. Now, the Cambrian explosion is going to be a really important event. So animal diversification is going to kind of rapidly accelerate from about 525 to 535 million years ago. And this is going to be during the time that we call the Cambrian period. During this time, all different types of animal body plans appear and the new phyla appear in the fossils. And it's such a short period of time and we're saying, you know, this is you know, 10 to 15 million years, but it still is for kind of the explosion of the amount of different groups that we're going to have come out. It is a very short period of time. This is a uh, image showing the basic body plans of all modern animals. And it's again thought that these are going to appear during the Cambrian period. Now the Cambrian explosion, we've talked about this before where Often there's going to be some type of mass extinction event and then there's an explosion of diversification often has to do with kind of rapid radiation into these different ecological niches or areas in the environment that are now empty. So at the beginning of the Cambrian period, which is 542 million years ago, animals went underwent this rapid diversification. And during that span of 15 million years, all the major body plans that we see today in our animals were present. Okay. Many of the animals that were present during this Cambrian explosion were very bizarre. Um, so many of them did not, they're no longer living, they went extinct. But all the ones that we do see today, you can see ancestral forms present during this Cambrian explosion time. Okay. The most celebrated area of Cambrian fossils is in British Columbia in a area called the Burgess Shell. Okay, and so I'll show you some images from the Burgess Shell. So here is an image of what the Burgess Shell looks like and then also a kind of fossil of some type of organism from that time and then a reconstruction of what they think that fossil would have looked like. Obviously the coloration is up to the artist, but this is what they believed this organism would have looked like. As you can tell, this looks sort of bizarre and strange and not something that we see today. Um, but again, many different groups of animals that evolved during this Cambrian explosion are no longer present on the planet. One question that many scientists have asked is what actually caused this Cambrian explosion? And there's a couple different hypotheses about how this um, may have happened. The first is this idea of increasingly complex predator-prey interactions. Okay, and so this would be the same type of interaction that you would see something like a, an antelope and a cheetah, where you have a predator that's trying to chase down the antelope. Antelope is the prey that's trying to get away from the predator. And so these complex interactions then kind of drive evolution um, 
during this time. There also is thought to have an increase in atmospheric oxygen, which then would kind of allow for different types of organisms to then evolve into new areas of the planet. Okay. Um, regardless of whatever caused the rapid diversification, they do think that there were kind of a set of master control genes that allowed for all these different complex body parts to evolve. Okay, so there's these genes um, that are in charge of kind of how the body is laid out and slight modifications in those master control genes could then change how the body is going to um, kind of develop. And so it's thought that this is gonna be kind of the source of all the genetic diversity for those different body plans. Now here is a painting that is from uh, an artist that's trying to kind of capture the Cambrian seascape. So the, what we're thinking right now mostly of uh, water organisms, so things that are going to live in the water. And you can see different organisms in this Cambrian seascape that look very similar to what we have today. So you can see like a jellyfish um, and some sea anemones and sea slugs, tunicates and things like that. Um, we have a trilobite, which is the fossil that's shown. Those were kind of a very prevalent animal um, during this time. So now we're going to talk about animal phylogeny, and this is going to be kind of trying to look at the major groups that are going to be the animals. Okay. So historically, biologists used body plan, so kind of how the shape of the body was structured, how many limbs, was there a mouth, was there an anus, um, those type of things. Those were the ways that most biologists would categorize the different animals. Now, you can create a phylog phylogenetic tree based on this. However, more recently, we've used genetic data to then kind of help refine these different groups. And so some things have changed where you have to move different organisms from different kind of animal groups based on genetic information, not necessarily what you see in the body plan. Now, one of the major branch points in the evolution of animals was this kind of distinction between one group of animals called the sponges and then the rest of the animals, which are going to be much more structurally complex. And so we'll talk about the sponges and then kind of the more complex groups that are going to follow. Now, if we look at sponges, they are not going to have tissues. Tissues are going to be kind of a collection of cells that are going to perform a similar function. And so sponges do not quite have that complexity. And so they're going to be where we start our kind of journey through animal diversity. So here is a phylogenetic tree that's showing the ancestral protist um, at the base of the tree. And we're going to start going through these different groups of the animals. So we're going to start with the sponges. They do not have true tissues. Uh, then we're going to go through the next groups that are going to have true tissues. And we'll talk about these. Today, we're only going to get up into the echinoderms. We are going to leave the chordates, which are the group that we're in, until the next lecture. So when we're talking about animal phylo phylogeny, I discussed different body plans. So we need to talk about those body plans before we can actually start to categorize the different groups. So there is going to be kind of a major split based on body symmetry. So you're going to have some groups of animals that are going to have one type of body symmetry and the rest are going to have a different type. So the first type of body symmetry is called radial symmetry. And this is going to be an organism that if you are going to cut it in half, you basically could cut it in any direction and you're going to have kind of mirror images on both sides. Okay, and so on the image we can see we have a sea anemone and a kind of looks like a, a pot that you would put a plant in. Both of these have radial symmetry. So there's kind of a central axis and then you can cut it in any direction and you get basically a mirror image um, on each side. Now, if you think about a human, you can't do that. Uh, you cannot cut us in half and have mirror images. Um, you can do that in one, you can cut a, a human in one way like that. Um, but the rest of the way, you would not have mirror images. And so these type of organisms with a more complex type of symmetry are called bilateral symmetry, where there is only one way to cut an organism in half that you would get equal halves. 
So the way that you could do this with a human is if you had a actual human, you could kind of take your human and you know cut them down this way. So that would be a you know mirror images, but you can't do a cut that would go like this and because you'd have the top of your body and the lower half of the body, those are not equal halves or mirror images of each other. So bilateral is going to mean that you can only cut it in one direction to have kind of equal halves. And so we have a lobster here and a shovel and both of these have bilateral symmetry. So this is going to be one of the things that we'll talk about when we're classifying the different organisms. So a little bit more about bilateral symmetry. So when you have bilateral symmetry, there is a definite head and that tends to be where you first encounter food, danger, and other stimuli. And so the head is gonna to start to be the place where we have kind of nervous cells, neurons, that are going to be able to detect and sense things in our environment. Okay, so that nerve center will form. Um, many of the organisms we talk about today won't necessarily have a brain, but we will start talking about brains in some of them. Okay, so, and they're gonna have a concentration of sense organs like their eyes. So think about humans, we have a head, this is going to have all of our different um, kind of sense organs in one place. Our brain is here and it's going to be able to have us interact with our environment. We also have um, kind of this adaptation with bilateral symmetry of having kind of two sides of our body that can aid in movement. So we can crawl, burrow, swim, walk, run, all these different types of things. And so having kind of two sides allow for this movement. Okay, many radial symmetrical animals that have that way where you can basically cut them in any direction, they are gonna be more stationary. There are some that can move, but many of them are going to be stationary where most bilateral animals are gonna be mobile. And by stationary, I mean that they are not moving throughout their environment. The second major body plan um, characteristic that we're gonna look at is this evolution of body cavities. And so very complex animals will have complete body cavities. So we have a complete body cavity. It means that we have a mouth, we also have an anus, and we have kind of a full uh, what we call the alimentary canal from our mouth that goes down our esophagus into our stomach, into our small intestine, large intestine, and ultimately out um, through our anus. And so that is going to be our full body cavity kind of um, separated. And a body cavity is going to be a fluid filled space separating the digestive tract from the outer body wall. Okay, so there are going to be certain organisms that will not have a body cavity at all. So this first image, um, we have is a planarian that does not have a body cavity. So you can see that there's a digestive tract in the yellow, but there is no fluid filled space in between that. So in our bodies for humans, our fluid filled space is where kind of the rest of our organs are gonna be. If we go to this next organism, which is the earthworm, this is gonna have a body cavity where there is the yellow digestive tract. There is then a layer of body cavity tissue a then a body cavity which is empty in this case in this picture and then another layer of kind of the tissue lining the cavity and then finally the body covering so this first group is going to be one that has no body cavity and i wanted to introduce this term called acelomate which is something that you're probably going to hear in lab so acelomate so the word coelomate has to do with like a body cavity and if you put A before it, it means that there is no body cavity. So this type of animal does not have a body cavity in the traditional sense of what a true body cavity is. So they're gonna have a digestive tract and they're not gonna have any kind of empty space um, between the digestive tract and the external part of the body. Okay, so there's no body cavity. Our next category is going to be something called acetocholin or acetocholamate. So pseudo means fake. So this is basically a fake body cavity. So it does have an actual um, body cavity, but the problem is that it is not lined by mesoderm. And so mesoderm is one of the kind of early tissues that forms and development. And in order to have a true 
body cavity, you have to have a uh, body cavity that is lined by mesoderm on both sides of it. And so I'll show you what that looks like. This last group, which is a true column or a coelomate, they have a body cavity or a column that is lined by mesoderm on both sides. And so you're going to see this area that has kind of, it's this empty space, but it's going to have mesoderm, which is this red tissue that is on both sides. And this is a true column. Okay, so it's a complete body cavity that is lined with mesoderm. The first time we will see this is in the annelids, um, and we'll mention it again. We are considered coelomates where we have a true body cavity as well. So for this lecture, we're going to focus on the invertebrates. So these are going to be organisms that do not have a backbone like us. They do not have kind of internal skeleton um, made out of bone um, or vertebra. There are going to be a couple that have a different type of skeleton that we'll talk about. And invertebrates are actually going to make up most of the animals on the planet. They make about 95% of all animals in the animal kingdom. So we're going to go through the different groups that are represented actually on this slide. So our first group are going to be called periphera, and these are the sponges. So periphera, I want you to think of pores or holes. These animals are going to have small holes that are going to allow them to filter feed food um, into their bodies. So sponges are going to be sessile, which means that they do not move. They do not have true tissues, okay? And they are originally thought to be plants. It's not really that hard to make that connection. They are not moving and they do kind of look plant-like. However, they are animals. Okay, they're going to have asymmetrical symmetry, which means that they're not actually going to fall into either the radial um, symmetry category or the bilater bilateral symmetry category. They're going to be in a different group where they have no symmetry at all, which means that you can't cut them any direction and get a mirror image of each other. They just don't have that type of symmetry. They are thought to have evolved from colonial protists. Okay, and when we look at the actual structure, hopefully it'll make a little sense of how that step could have taken place. They can be pretty small, about one centimeter, um, but they also can get quite large, around two meters big. They do not have nerves or muscles, but their cells are capable of sensing changes in their environment and they can respond to the environment. So they are kind of becoming more complex. Most of them are going to be marine, although I think you can find some in fresh water. The body of a sponge is going to resemble a sac with little holes or perforations. They're going to have specialized cells called choanocytes, and these cells are going to have flagella on them. The choanocytes will draw water into the walls of the sponge where the food is then going to be collected. They can trap things like bacteria and other food particles they have this mucus inside and then can engulf the food by something called endocytosis, where they just kind of take a big amount of the food and bring it into their cells. There are another type of cell called amoebocytes, and these are going to actually pick up the food from the choanocytes, digest it, and then carry the nutrients to the other cells. So they do have kind of two specialized cell types in the sponges. Amoebocytes are also going to manufacture these, thing, these little fibers that are going to help make up kind of a skeleton of the sponge. And they're little like spicules um, that are kind of pokey, but if you see a sponge that has dried out, you can actually see them. So here we have a living sponge, um, what it looks like in the wild, and then we have a cartoon version of what a sponge looks like, and we have the different cells. So there are pores that are going to be along the body of the sponge, and then we're going to have our choanocytes, which are these cells that are going to have flagella that will kind of help bring in the food. They're going to be called feeding cells. We then are going to have amoebocytes that are going to kind of help digest the food and then move nutrients from different places. You can see the skeletal fibers in this yellow. Um, those things are the spicules that give some support and shape to this organism. Our next group are gonna be the Nidarians. 
So the Nadarians, you're going to notice, has a silent C at the beginning, um, and you do not say the C, so it's called Nadarians. So phylum Nadaria is going to be characterized by the presence of body tissues. So unlike the sponges, these are now going to have kind of specialized cells that are going to do the same function. They are going to have radial symmetry, so you can cut them kind of any direction and you'll have kind of basic mirror images of each other. They're going to have tentacles with stinging cells, which is how they get their name. So we'll talk about the, the nidocytes. Okay. And they are going to include things like sea anemones, hydras, and jellies. So when we look at the basic body plan of a nadarian, it has a sac-like body shape with a gastrovascular cavity. And so the gastrovascular is going to be this area that's going to kind of be where digestion takes place. Um, and it's different. It's not a, a true cavity. It does not have a kind of a mouth and an anus. It has actually just one hole that is an anus mouth hybrid. Okay, so a true body cavity has to have kind of a discrete mouth and a discrete anus. Um, so there's two openings. There are two different body plans. There is the polyp form, which is sessile, which means it does not move. So if you've seen a sea anemone, these things are not swimming. I mean, they will move kind of their little tentacles, but they are not swimming through the water. And then you can have the medusa type, which is what our standard jellyfish looks like. Okay, so a jelly is going to be able to sw swim through the, the actual water and has this name called the medusa. So here is just a variety of different um, nadarians. They're quite beautiful. So nadarians are going to have these specialized tentacles that are going to allow for them to catch prey. Okay, so they're going to have uh, kind of tentacles arranged around their mouth parts that can capture prey and push the prey into their mouth cavity and into the gastrovascular cavity where they can start digestion. Now there's these specialized sting cells on the tentacles called nidocytes and they are going to act in both defense but also to help capture prey and this image is going to show how the nidocyte actually can discharge its thread that can then um, cause the stinging to take place our next group are phylum mollusca and these are going to include things like the octopus and also chitons so mollusks are going to have soft bodies they are sometimes going to be protected by a hard shell, so snails are going to be in this group. Uh, many of the moths will have a kind of feeding organ called a radula, which I will show a picture of in a couple slides, but it's kind of like a file and it helps to scrape food off of different surfaces. There are kind of 100,000 known species of mollusks, uh, and most of them are going to be marine. And I absolutely love sea slugs. And so you're going to see a lot of pictures of these amazingly colorful sea slugs on these slides. Mollusks are going to have similar body plans, uh, and they're going to include these three main parts. So the first part is a muscular foot, which is going to be used for movement. And so if you have ever looked at a snail, the foot is going to be this portion of the body that is going to be sitting on the ground and actually going to cause the snail to be able to move. The next part is going to be the visceral mass, which is going to be kind of the area under the shell that is going to contain the internal organs. And the last part is going to be the mantle, which is a fold of tissue that secretes a shell if it's going to be present. So not all moths will have shells. Okay? And the radula, the part that I was talking about earlier, is going to be this kind of file-like scraping structure that allows for the mollusks to scrape food off of different surfaces. So there are three main groups of mollusks. The first are going to be gastropods, and the word gastropod means stomach foot. So they have basically a foot and then their stomach inside the shell. So this is going to include snails, which are going to have that single spiral shell. Uh, and if you've ever picked up a snail, you know they can hide inside of it, so it's going to help protect it. There are also going to be slugs that do not have actual shells. 
The next group are called the bivalves, and these are going to include clams, oysters, mussels, and scallops. They're called bivalves because they have two shells that are held together kind of with a hinge. And our last group are called the cephalopods, and cephalopod means head foot. And these are going to be mainly uh, kind of squids and octopi that have this head, large head, and then you have kind of the feet part or the part that's going to allow them to um, locomote. They tend to have very large brains and they do have shells, but most of the time the shells are going to be internal and you can't actually see them. So here are some snails that we can see. They have their shell and are going to um, kind of be in moist environments. Here we have some sea slugs, very vibrant colors, absolutely beautiful. Take a time and Google them and you're going to be amazed at all the different types you can find. Here are a couple other ones. Um, some of them look like little bunnies in the bottom left corner. Um, but again, they're truly amazing um, and have these bright, brilliant colors. We have some examples of our bivalves right here. And here are some examples of cephalopods. These are all octopi. These are nautilus, which is another group and they are going to have an external shell. They live in the water um, and are kind of interesting. They, they look like they're swimming backwards. So now we're moving on to the flatworms and this is Phylum Um When you're in lab or in lecture, you can kind of use flatworm or platyhementhes interchangeably. Now the flatworms get their names flatworms or platyamethes, which means flat worm, because they are flat. They're very um, kind of thin and ribbon-like. So flatworms are going to be the simplest animals with bilateral symmetry, and they are going to range from anywhere from one millimeter in length to 20 meters, about 65 feet in length. So they can be very large. Most flatworms are going to have kind of a highly branched gastrovascular cavity, but it only has a single opening. So you have an anus mouth combo again in this group. There are about 20,000 different species of flatworms living in the marine, freshwater, and damp terrestrial habitats. So here are some different examples of flatworms. We have some that are going to be free living in marine, freshwater, or damp habitats. But we also are going to have some that are parasites. And so we have a blood fluke on here. Uh, these are going to live off the host and kind of extract their nutrients from the host. It's good for them, bad for the host. Blood flukes and tapeworms are going to parasitize many vertebrates. Here is the body plan of planarian, which is a type of flatworm. They have this branched gastrovascular cavity. They're going to have a mouth anus spot. And these actually have what look like little tiny eyes, which are actual nervous tissue clusters and are going to be able to uh, kind of respond to environmental cues. On this slide, you can see a tapeworm up close and see the head anatomy that's going to have these hooks that allow it to hook into the usually the intestines of their host allow them to kind of extract their nutrients from that and then we have a blood fluke with both the male and female um, and you can see the sucker parts of them now one really interesting thing about planarians is that people do experiments with these where you chop them in half and you can take off their head and they will regrow a head in a matter of days uh, so it's really interesting and they've studied a lot about kind of body plans and how different cells are created for different fates um, in planarians because they have this ability to regenerate all their different body parts. Our next group are the annelids and this is going to include the earthworm which I think most of you are familiar with but also some really other interesting other organisms including the terrifying bobbit worm which I have a video for you guys to watch. The annelids are going to form phylum annelida, and they have what we call body segmentation, where you have these body segments or units 
that are going to be repeated along the length of the body. Okay. There are going to be about 6, 16,500 Annelida species. Some of them are going to be very small, while other ones can grow up to three meters long. Most Annelidas are going to live in damp soil. Um, they also can live in the sea and most freshwater habitats. And you can see some kind of really beautiful different types of Annelidas on this screen. So Annelidas are gonna have kind of shared characteristics with other bilateral animals except for the flatworms. And so they're gonna have a complete digestive tract which has a mouth and an anus, separate openings. Okay, and they're also going to have a true body cavity. So there is going to be a body cavity that is lined on both sides by mesoderm, which is kind of our definition of a true body cavity. Now there are two main groups that are kind of based on kind of how active they are. So one group, these are the Eritarians. These are going to be marine and have kind of active mobile ways of living. Um, you're going to have some organisms called ragworm, which crawl or burrow in sediments, and others are going to be free swimming. The second groups are going to be more sedentary, although they do move, um, but aren't quite as active as the other group. And these are going to include earthworms, leeches, and um, tube dwellers. Now, these are kind of based on molecular evidence of the groups. And so within these, these two categories, you, we can have other kind of ways to classify them. So I'm going to discuss three groups of annelids that uh, are kind of more common. We have the earthworms, the polychichates, and the leeches. So here is just some diversity of the different types of annelids. Now this is the bobbit worm which is absolutely terrifying. These things can get very long. And so on the next slide, I've provided a video for you to kind of learn a little bit more about the bobbit worm. So this is the video. So if you want to watch it, uh, it's quite interesting. The leeches are going to be a group that are going to be blood suckers. So they can suck the blood of different animals. Um, they also do it of humans, uh, kind of gross. Uh, they've also been used in kind of different forms of medicine for a pretty long time, even including today. And here are the earthworms. There are some absolutely giant earthworms that you can find in Australia and other parts of the world. Um, I don't think any of those are quite that big in the United States, um, but we have kind of the normal ones. This next group is called Phylomematoda, and they're going to also be called the roundworms. So roundworms are going to get their common name because they have this cylindrical body uh, that's tapered at both ends. They do not have segments like the Annelidas, and so they're going to have nice round bodies. They also are different from flatworms because they are not flat. They're going to be round. So nematodes are extremely important in uh, decomposition. They're also very important in kind of agriculture and they can be parasites in both plants and animals. Roundworms are probably one of the most numerous and widespread of the animals. There are about 25,000 known species, but we think that there's probably 10 times more than that. Um, and we just don't have kind of a grasp on how many there truly is. Okay. And they can range from very small, about one millimeter to one meter. So here is some diversity of roundworms. We have a free living roundworm, and we have some parasitic roundworms in pork, and we see the head of a, a hookworm. Okay, so these are going to be able to hook in and kind of extract, again, their nutrition from a host. Our next group is phylum arthropoda, and these are gonna be the insects, which is an extremely diverse and um, kind of very cool phylum. So the name arthropoda, I want you to think like arthritis, that has to do with joints. And so these are going to have jointed limbs or appendages. So if you look at the limbs of the insects, they have these joints um, that you can see. So arthropods are going to include crustaceans, which are going to be like crabs and lobster. 
The arachnids, like spiders and scorpions, insects, which are going to be like bees, um, butterflies, uh, grasshoppers, things like that. And there are going to be over 1 million arthropod species. So it is one of the most kind of numerous groups. Most of them are actually going to be in insects, and many of them are going to be beetles. There are a ton of different species of beetles. Okay. Arthropods are going to be one of the most successful animal phyla, and they are represented in almost all habitats on the biosphere. So basically anywhere you can go, you can find some type of arthropod. They are going to be segmented um, where they have kind of different parts of their body and they have specialized uh, mouth feeding parts and other parts of their body that allow them to do pretty amazing things. So here are the four groups that we're going to go over. The arachnids, crustaceans, millipedes and centipedes, and the insects. Now, if you look at kind of your general arthropod, they're going to have a body that is going to be covered in something called an exoskeleton. So unlike humans where we have an endoskeleton, this is going to be on the outside. And because it's on the outside, it is going to uh, have to be changed when they grow. Now, this exoskeleton is going to help provide protection for the actual insect, but also is going to allow for attachment of muscles that will allow them to move. Now, when a arthropod gets larger, it will have to shed its exoskeleton and secrete a new one. And so unlike humans, where inside of our bodies, our bones are actually growing with us, these insects will actually have to get rid of their exoskeleton ever so often. And not just the insects, all the arthropods. This whole process is called molting. When the arthropod molts, they're vulnerable because they're not going to be kind of protected in their exoskeleton. And usually we'll need to be very careful during that time. Here are some images of, I think all of these are just insects that are kind of molting their exoskeleton. Here is the the general plan of a crustacean, you can see that um, there is kind of a cephalothorax, which is a head and thorax combination. They have an abdomen. They're going to have swimming appendage. They have walking legs. They also are going to have pinchers that are there for defense and antennae and eyes that are going to be able to help them kind of have some sensory reception. Our first group are going to be the arachnids, and the arachnids are going to include scorpions, spiders, ticks, and mites. They usually live on land and generally are going to have four pairs of walking legs and a specialized pair of feeding appendages. So normally when you're trying to figure out if it's, you know, an insect or an arachnid, you count the number of limbs. Now on here, I have three pictures of what are called peacock spiders. They're absolutely tiny. These things are really small um, and they do these amazing courtship dances. And I have a, a link for a YouTube video that shows some of these dances. So here are some of the other groups of the arachnids. They are going to include dust mites, ticks, spiders, and scorpions. They also are going to have silk spinning appendages, which is not found in any of the other groups that we'll talk about today. The next group are the crustaceans, and these are going to include lots of really good things to eat, like crabs, lobsters, crayfish, shrimp, and barnacles. And barnacles are actually going to be able to attach themselves to lots of different things, including whales. And so sometimes you'll see whales that will have barnacles that are kind of stuck to them. They have multiple pairs of specialized appendages, so some of these are going to have pincher claws. They're almost all aquatic. So that's kind of one of the big characteristics of crustaceans. And there is going to be one group that lives on land, which is going to be the pill bug, or as I like to call the roly poly. These animals are going to exhibit kind of all the arthropod characteristics of multiple pairs of specialized appendages. And so you can just see uh, the diversity of kind of different colors and shapes and sizes of the crustaceans. Here is another kind of picture of diversity. They tend to have three pairs of 
walking limbs, although they can sometimes have more. Um, and we do have a picture of the pill bug here, so you can see the one terrestrial group. Our next group are the millipedes and centipedes, and these are going to be terrestrial arthropods that are going to have these repeated body segments that have legs sticking out of them. Now millipedes, which is going to be the, the organism on the left, is going to feed on decaying plant matter, and they're going to have two legs coming out of each body segment on both sides. Centipedes are going to be carnivores, and they have a specialized pair of poison claws that they use for defense and to paralyze their prey. They are going to have just one leg per segment on each side. Now our last group are going to be the insects, and they're going to make up most of the diversity within the arthropods. They are going to typically have three different parts of their body, which are the head, thorax, and abdomen. They have a head that's going to have a pair of sensory antenna and a pair of eyes. They have different types of mouth parts depending on what they eat. And in this cartoon image I have, I show five different types of mouth parts. Flight is going to be very important to the success of the insects. And I was recently looking up how many times flight evolved in insects, and I can only actually find that it evolved once, which I think before I said it evolved multiple times. I still need to look on, look that up, but I um, at least evolved once in the insects. Okay, insects are going to outnumber all other forms of life combined on the planet. Uh, there are lots and lots of them. And they're going to live in almost every terrestrial habitat, um, including some that are in the water, air, and sometimes in the sea. Okay, The arthropods that are in the sea are mostly going to be the crustaceans, but there are a few insects that you can be found there as well. Because insects are so numerous, they're going to impact our lives and the lives of other animals and organisms on the planet in many different ways. So insects are going to make up most of the pollinators for our different agricultural products and so they're going to be very important and without them doing that job we would be kind of in a world of hurt but they're also going to be kind of harmful in some ways to humans because of different diseases that they cause we can think of in, um, mosquitoes that cause things like malaria and other insects that are going to be able to transmit human diseases um, which can be very deadly so insects are going to provide this really good example of how there are interactions within biological systems. So here is an image showing different diversity of insects. We have rhinoceros beetle, rainbow shield bugs, weevils, butterflies, blue dasher dragonfly, a katydid, praying mantis, and a robber fly. One interesting thing that insects do is they undergo something called metamorphosis. Okay. So some young will resemble adults, but they'll be smaller and have slightly different proportions of the body. Um, and they will then go through a series of molts each time looking more like the adults. So they kind of start off small, but similar to an adult, and then they'll just get larger and larger. There are other cases where you're going to have distinctive larval stages that will be specialized for different functions like eating okay, and growing. And then the adult stages will be different and will be specialized for things like dispersal and reproduction. So if you look at the case of the monarch butterfly, the larva is going to be specialized for eating, and that's what it does. It doesn't need wings because it's just going to sit in one spot. It's going to eat. It's then going to go through a pupation, and it's then going to develop wings that are going to allow it to fly off and reproduce. So you'll see kind of different larval and adult stages. The last group we're going to talk about today are their echinodermata. The echinoderms are going to be named after their spiny surfaced skin. And so if you look at a sea urchin or a sea star, they have this kind of spiky skin. They are not going to have body segments. So you can't see any regular repeated segment like you saw in the annelids. They're going to normally have radial symmetry as adults, so that means you can cut them in any direction and they're going to be mirror images, but they're actually going to be bilaterally symmetrical when they're larva, so when they're very young. They're going to have something called an endoskeleton, which is an interior skeleton, and it's going to be made up of these hard plates that are just beneath the skin. 
Now this is the first group that's going to have an endoskeleton much like humans. Okay, it's obviously very different because it's not going to be made out of the same components, but it is an endoskeleton, so it's inside of the body. They're all going to be marine, and they're going to have this thing called the water vascular system, which is a series of water-filled canals that will help circulate throughout the body um, and facilitate gas exchange and waste disposal. So I wanted to show you a little bit more about the endoskeleton. And so on the right, we have two sea urchins that have been dried, and you can see just the endoskeleton present. And so this is going to be inside and is going to give stability to the kind of the sea urchin. Um, there are going to be these things called ossicles, which are going to be small um, calcium elements that are going to be embedded within the dermis of the body wall of the echinoderms. And then in the bottom, we have actually a fossilized um, kind of ancient echinoderm where you can see the actual ossicles that have been preserved in the fossilization process. The echinoderms are going to include a large variety of organisms. They're going to have sea stars, we're going to have sand dollars, sea cucumbers, sea urchins, and things like that. Here are some really pretty images of some brittle stars, uh, feather stars, and in the center top is what a sand dollar looks like when it is still alive. So the kind of germs are actually going to be the closest group to the chordates, which is going to include us and the other vertebrates. When you look at the embryonic development, you can differentiate the echinoderms and chordates away from the other groups like the mollusks, flatworms, annelids, and roundworms, and the arthropods. And so the echinoderms are going to be our closest relative when it comes to these groups of organisms that we talked about today. Now, as a extra credit activity, if you are watching this video and you have until June 1st, to turn this in, otherwise you're too late. I would like you to use the different phylums that we went over today and name what phylum the different characters of SpongeBob SquarePants are in. So on this picture we have um, Patrick, we have Squidward and SpongeBob, and then our next slide we have Mr. Krabs and Gary, and so I want you to name all of those different characters and what phylum they are found in. And you should have all the information from today's lecture to name the correct phylums.